So this is um, a session to take um, a bit in, in pieces uh, for the rest of the day, the excellent overview that both uh, Dirtz and uh, Marty uh, provided. Um, so we'll try to now take uh, piece by piece uh, the, the components of, of, of this change process. And so this session devoted to um, the open banking. It will be co-moderated by myself and uh, Mantas. Um, and we'll start off by asking our colleagues to introduce themselves uh, and what they are covering in their respective roles. Should I start? Ladies uh, first. <laughs> yes. My name is uh, Emma Strömfeldt. Uh, I work at Swedbank as head of innovation. Uh, and what that means for us is both, of course, of course, working with internal innovation culture and so on, but also lots and lots of fintech partnerships. And that has led me to, to uh, b become responsible also for our open banking uh, initiative that we launched earlier this year. And I have a background from uh, multiple different digital startups and being a startup entrepreneur myself. So I have spent more than 15 years in very fast, fast uh, moving uh, digital native uh, companies and less than two years in, in banks. So, uh, but this take changing this culture is really, really interesting. Um, it's happening now. Yeah. All right, thanks. I'm Harri Rantanen. I'm a Finn working in Sweden for SCB in transaction services, which is an organization within large corporates and financial institutions, so the old merchant banking, if you uh, recognize by that name. Uh, I have been working uh, as a business developer for uh, from 1st of May last year, 10 years in bank, and before that I've been working in multiple customer implementation, initiation reporting, formats and standards. I'm an ISO 2022 expert. And I work within that also outside you the bank. You need to explain that. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's the financial services standard, and that was a huge debate regarding that e even in PSD2. I can go further in details, even though I'm an economist and have a business degree, but I'm really keen on uh, digital IT things. I am speculating with some cryptocurrencies. I have bank accounts in N26 and Monzo and, mm -hmm. and uh, Ibaku and, and all of these new banks, uh, and Revolut even. Revolut is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I really try to experiment myself where, is, where, where the world is going in financial services. And before my time uh, in, uh, in SAB, I worked for Opus Capita, which is one of the fintechs. We, we didn't call them as a fintech in that time, but it's now spreading all over the, the Baltic Rim. So I have my background in, in uh, developing things for large corporate especially, but now, of course, with open banking, where I have been working in SAB from uh, April, March last year, uh, we have been now also investigating, of course, from the private customer and SME perspective. So really interesting spectrum of, of things happening. And uh, for our dear audience, I would like to say that this is not a fireplace chat, so you are not the fireplace. <laughs> uh, basically, basically, for this discussion to be lively, we would like your questions and your, your ideas and also confront both us and the speakers. With, uh, with what you think about the future and the, about the digital agenda. So, so don't be a fireplace, you know, be a fire. Um, so maybe we should start right away and uh, maybe you could give your thoughts about this, about this digital transformation and PSD2 and, and what really is about to happen in the upcoming months or years. And some people have been arguing that PSD2 is actually the biggest uh, experiment that Europe is doing with the data of our customers. How do you look on it? And how, what kind of advantages can the banks and the entire ecosystem get from it? There is uh, certainly, a p I can relate to, to uh, what you just uh, said, because we haven't really seen it in that massive scale before. Um, I think Sweden and the Baltics is a little bit Different in Sweden, we have s lots and lots of uh, companies that have already been using uh, the data from banks for for many years. So maybe the shift is slightly uh, smaller, um, but still, I think the debate has been uh, a lot about engaging with uh, smaller companies and with uh, fintechs and the startups, which is really really good. Which will lead to a uh, higher speed of innovation. It will lead to many more uh, fintech partnerships with banks. Uh, it will lead to lots of uh, benefits for the consumers, uh, easier commerce, all of these fantastic things that we all want. Uh, but it's certainly a number of risks that are not 
yet sort of mitigated in a proper way, such as what, what happens to your financial information once the difference between having it in one place with the bank where it's safe or having it spread across 20, 50 different entities. It's enough that one of these different entities sort of mess something up um, and that data is gone. It's going to be really difficult to trace uh, wh where it went wrong or who's responsible for this. Um, another thing that we should touch upon in terms of risk, I think, is the fact that we have been, <laughs> the discussion has been uh, around um, incentivizing startups, while I think that in reality what we will see will happen is lots of startup activities, but we also roll out the red carpet for the big American and Chinese tech giants that are coming into Europe, uh, that already have consumer trust, uh, and that will get the European consumers to happily uh, hand over their financial data. Um, and the consequences of Europe <coughs> for that? Not sure. It hasn't been debated enough, I think. Harry. Yeah, I can resonate via the work that we did last year regarding the how to implement or actually take in into account the open banking in our uh, customer segment, LCFI, uh, large corporates, financial institutions, private customers and small enterprises, uh, business planning. So that was a really good example of that, how difficult the mindset uh, change in the banks are because the people responsible for the business uh, planning and, and items for how to banks, how to steer the bank forward in, in, in this digitalization and new challenges it is really difficult for them to understand what open banking is. So if I try to say open banking is, is APIs, application program interface, <gasps> oh, that's IT, I don't understand anything. Please say something else. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, open banking, we will open up our information for third parties. <gasps> oh, that's frightening. We, should, we shouldn't do that. We are used to this closed banking, our customers, our products, our channels, nothing else. But then I say, this is about information, sharing information, using external information together with our own information. And then they realize, okay, now we are talking about something and, and the information is the new oil mm -hmm. and we have to think about that how we do the revenue, revenue models, of course, by the consent of the end customer because the risks that Emma was talking about, that's of course something that we have to take care. We saw also in the, in the previous discussions and, and presentations about this, a uh, matter of trust we are, uh, SCB is 160 years old bank and of course it's not merit and credit anymore that much but that means the trust and, and that's why we should be also really really concerned that we do not mess without the, mm. the customer information and we, we should see how the third party providers, what kind of third party providers they are and take care of this due diligence but on the same time we shouldn't block the innovations because that's the big thing which is happening now. And this is really critical for the financial industry overall now, how we meet these third party providers and, and also compete with these, these uh, big uh, players, like you said, from, from US and, and China. We, we really have big concerns in European, European context, how we will manage overall. Mm. Can, I, can I add Absolutely. to that again? Absolutely. Uh, to say from the bank uh, perspective, of course, that I think we have a responsibility uh, also to help educate our uh, customers and our users because there is a big difference between third-party companies that we happily invite, happily share data with, co-innovate together with, and this is all happening on the open banking platform, because we have also done our due diligence towards these companies and they are a trusted partner uh, and we can sort of represent uh, this this co-innovation towards our our uh, customers, that's very very different. Then you know if something goes wrong, the customer can actually come to us and we can say that well this was a trusted partner and of course we take responsibility because we safeguard these processes. Um, but with PSD2 and so on, there are lots of of third parties coming to get data where we cannot refuse, yeah. where we cannot uh, do the controls, where we. Cannot and, and for the consumer to understand the difference, I think, is going to be quite challenging. But I think we have been talking only about the banking perspective. We need to understand also the regulator's perspective, because what you're touching upon, this is responsibility of the regulator. And if regulator allows everyone, including the fraudster, to come in to my bank account and take my consumer, to take my data, including my payment history mm -hmm. and my payment, pat payment, payment patterns, 
That's the problem of the regulator, isn't it? Uh, Montes, I, I think this is a good point where for us, um, as you were talking, reflecting, we're talking about PSD as a legal requirement and an implementation of open banking. Now, if we look uh, to the discussions that we're both part as part of the European Banking Federation, there is a huge disconnect across the Europe where um, it's safe to say that the Nordics, Baltics are in a different uh, discussion than many other uh, of our, our colleagues, where it's how do we reach the minimum level of PSD co compliance? And here we're talking about open banking. So I think given given the, the audience here, it would be great if you can a bit um, talk through this segments of what, uh, how do you see this? One, PSD2 one thing. and the open <coughs> Yeah, let's talk about PSD2 first. The scope of PSD2 within account information and payment initiations is this much. Account information, payment initiations in total are this much. Open banking is something that my mm. hands are not enough to, to describe the scope. So uh, PSD2 is a good thing because it's pushing us forward. But I'm, I'm referring to Nord Nordea's uh, Gunnar Barrier who really well said, PSD2 is pushing banks to open up for, for competition. So we have to open up our infrastructure so that the third party providers can provide better services that we, we banks may not be able to offer. But open banking is about collaboration, which we talked also here earlier, so that how we can co-create things with the fintechs which are able to create things. If we open up our infrastructure, of course, by consent of the end user, then uh, we can in together uh, implement things that we are not able to do. Let's uh, compare to, to Google Maps. They, they, that's a platform provider. And, and even Google is a, one of the best innovators in the world. They also admit that they are not able to innovate everything that is, uh, can be done based on location information. We must say also in the banks that we may not be the best ones to innovate what can be done based on account information. And that's the, the relevance that how we can invite uh, persons and people all over the world to innovate on, on that critical thing of, of our daily life called financial services. And that's really important. And one point more is that I just read from UK study. UK is the forerunt, uh, for a forerunner country in overall in Europe regarding this, even though they decided to do the Brexit, which is really sad. But anyway, they had a an study about that uh, when they asked from normal private customers, would you like to open up your financial information for third party providers like PSD2 is say? 91% said absolutely no. Then they asked, mm. would you like to do payments via Facebook or WhatsApp or, or Google? Oh, yes, absolutely. And mm. Facebook, Google, they are not having their own bank account structure. Only way for them is to do PSD2 type of payment initiation service of the setups. So it's, it's about how we talk about this thing. And, and regulation is, 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 of course, good thing in positive regulation means. But we, we have to also think that how we ourselves in Nordics, in Baltics, interpret the regulation. I created my N26 bank account last summer via iPhone chat in six minutes, uh, showing my passport here and there behind my telephone. In six minutes, I was a customer in German bank as a foreigner. Uh, I can tell that it's not working like that in SCB in, in Sweden, uh, as a fin to make a bank account in Sweden. I agree. I am Lithuanian who tried to make a bank account in SCB. I finally got it, but yeah. it took me two to three months. Yes. Uh, but in N26, you're correct. Six and they are not, and they are not uh, breaking any regulation, no. and, but they are masters of, of collaboration, these fintechs. They, I, I exactly know of what kind of uh, subcontractor they use for uh, seeing persons' uh, credibility in 150 countries. So they use a service which is giving them uh, credi credibility uh, information for making the know your customer much, much smoother mm -hmm. than we do here. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience? Ideas? Yes, go ahead. Uh, um, my name is Lala Medin. I'm, I'm from the Ministry of Justice, so that's why it will be a legal question. Uh, mm. <laughs> sorry for that. No one, no, no one is a lawyer here. So. Uh, <laughs> no one is perfect, I know. <laughs> Uh, but the we have to stop talking now. <laughs> 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 the question is actually what you talked about, all the data sharing and, and uh, for example, as you described that uh, in this N26, the decision is made in six minutes and there have been uh, change, uh, checks in different places, different services. And if a customer gets a negative decision, who is taking the responsibility if that information which is checked has been checked wrongly? Mm -hmm. Good point. I don't know. 
I can't answer that question. Shall we? Shall we I call was lucky to be seconds? credible. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, I think nicely brings us to um, your ISO uh, headline that you mentioned, which is that there is so much room for interpretation also within PSD2 PSD and other, other lines of regulation. There is a huge space for the standardization initiatives on the, on the industry side. So maybe you can talk us through a bit uh, of those. I would actually like to respond to your <laughs> question <laughs> <laughs> before, before we jump up. Ju just, um, or, or at least from a conceptual point of view, because I think we've seen technology moving really, really fast, and usually leg legislation lagging behind. So we, I think we have a too high belief in the fact that just the fact that I walk in with a passport into a branch office, and there's a human there, and that human is going to say, if I'm the, the person in the... I mean, the, the room for mistake here is quite high. Uh, if we compare it to sort of modern technology with all the biometrics and everything that they can actually do, which is real time, then we can still have... If the, you know, then it, it, we can create a smooth process for lots of people. Of course, if I'm denied, if the technology says I'm not who, who I am, of course we can reroute and we can have another <coughs> process and so on. But that's we can at least uh, sort of smooth, soften up the process for a lot of people. Yeah, the, my and question was uh, more, when I go to branch, I see a human who has yeah. made a mistake, I can sue that human. Mm. But if the decision is made by <laughs> robot, whom am I going to sue? Ministry of Justice. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, you can. I, I think this uh, topic actually raises very, very good uh, conceptual question because uh, how we are identifying customers. Now, mm -hmm. we are, again, in this ego system. So each bank is identifying separately. Yes. State is identifying separately. Each is sitting on, on data. And concept, what we presume nowadays, is that each is owning customer data. But uh, we must understand mm -hmm. that only owner for customer data is customer himself. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a great opportunity for really partnership uh, as well between uh, private mm. and, and, and state, how to create this uh, identification uh, really based on biometrics, more secure, uh, not sitting on data that, okay, this is a stolen document register, but uh, mm. banks uh, hardly can access it. Yeah, So banks need to create alternative list. So this is actually... Mm. <clears throat> Not very wise. No. And yeah. something that can be exported uh, or passported as well, because yes. we have a lot of national yeah. built-up identification yeah. methods, but how do we share that? Yeah, let's talk um, about file w for a while about that, because we have, of course, AIDAS, which is the standard platform or standard for, for I uh, electronic identification. But uh, still, all the countries in Europe are doing like they want. But they have, of course, some of them are ADAS compatible and some of them are not. So, for example, Bank ID in Sweden is really close by. Yeah. And, and, of course, if I'm as a Finnish uh, customer of SCB or worker, employee in, in SCB, want to have a bank account, I cannot paste that on Bank ID because Bank ID is given only for actual Swedes. And then the problem here is that the banks are in a key role in, in many terms of, of identification and, and services, electronic services in different countries. And, and then there are customers and then there are private persons who are not uh, capable of having bank account or bank relation at all. So that we have to solve. And then we have this standardization because I think that all the digitalization initiatives, open banking included, is based on that how we can do that in a more standard way. So we should have only one single instance of, of identity of ourselves. Corporates should have one global yes. instance of identity. And then we, pers as persons, we should have the role and different roles in different entities described also in one single place. But it's really difficult to achieve with the, the, co with the existing way in Europe now. National uh, agendas and, and initiatives are there. E-identity e or residency in Estonia is a good example how we would go further and, and uh, investigating how, how that could be expanded. So I know that there are services outside Estonia who, who are using that type of identity and now they are promoting that for UK private persons and companies because they are Brexited. So if they want to uh, remain in EU area, they can, they can acquire that by small price. I think you're onto something really important, and if we're related to PSD2 and, and open banking, from our perspective, what we, w when someone comes to us and knocks on our doors and say, hey, we want to get this, this piece of information or this data, we need to verify that there is a customer consent. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
we need to verify that if you you claim you're SEB, how do I know that you're SEB? Sort of, how, what's the SEB identity here? Uh, plus, how do I, maybe not with SEB, but with a smaller player, how do I know that this uh, we have the PSD2 uh, digital certificate? Right? I need to know that you're licensed to actually uh, have the right to, to get this. And I know that each sort of FSA has, is, is supposed to keep a register and, and so on. But all of these things we need to sort of verify before we uh, let this date out. And it's not yet 100% standardized. There are no. bits and pieces. But and we have a re re regulatory gap, I think. In and all of this <laughs> in a couple of milliseconds. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Is it, is it easily manipulated? Or could it be easily manipulated? Well, we for our if you if you measure, then we have PSD two, but we have GDPR, and for the banks, <laughs> uh, don't if, even I mean, mention it. No, but uh, for us, we need to, and GDPR is even more strict, to be honest. So if we need to choose, we're likely going to go with GDPR. Let's talk about <laughs> G GDPR, sensitive <laughs> customer data. What about bank account? This is so interesting discussion which we talk over every time for international customers, corporate customers. So when we report a bank account statement and, the, and someone has paid to corporate account something, can we show the debtor account or not? Some countries are saying definitely not. Some countries in Europe say you must show that because that's part of the reconciliation process for large corporates. So is bank account and sensitive data uh, from this perspective? I haven't heard any good answers. Should those countries who are now showing that and using that as a reconciliation method stop doing that? If we interpret in, in European level that bank account is an unsensitive data. So and really simple exercise for the brains. But then uh, link this back to, to the question that Emma po um, pointed to, which is that the service provider that will be doing the reconciliation, gathering the content, etc., will be licensed in one of the EU member states, right? And um, and so again, going to kind of the positions each of our national states then take, like you know, for example, Ministry of Finance uh, being part of the ECOFIN discussions, for example, on. Very practical things like whether EBA, European Banking Authority, should maintain a machine-readable register of third-party providers. If they opt not to maintain a machine-readable register of third-party providers, it's very clear what the game will be. The biggest players on the market will be the places where the third-party providers will be licensed and where everybody will be able, able to cross-check their, their licenses. And therefore, the responses to the questions that you pose will be of those regulators and the stance that they adopt. So that's um, going back to kind of the, the, the huge potential for us uh, as Nordics, Baltics to actually try to be part of these discussions and, 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 and uh, not have only the, the German and the French solutions uh, <laughs> for the machine readable registers uh, take precedence. But that's, um, so how are you, I think we, understanding all of these complexities, the uncertainties, uh, as a business developer for open banking, both of you, how are you actually taking the, the ideas and the concepts to the uh, deployment stage with all of this around? Uh, maybe you can take us through some of the specific functions, some of the specific applications you're currently working on. Yeah, I, ca I can tell, tell about this Think uh, collaboration that we have. So that's one option to, to take in and, and FinTech and collaborate with them. They are really good in, in analyzing the person, person, personal account finances. And, and we, we made an investment for Think and, and continue collaborating with them. And, and we have implemented some parts of their solution. And now we are discussing with them, should that be expanded to corporate accounts also? And not only for, for Swedish-based customers, but also for international ones. So that's one way forward, so that we, we co-create something. And then, of course, we have to consider ourselves at how we prepare our <coughs> complex infrastructure to be more dynamic on the interfaces so that we can do this type of uh, collaborations in a better way. So that's somehow an, an IT problem or IT challenge. On the business level, we have a lot of ideas how to go further and different kind of ideas going further from the PSD2. And of course, PSD2 already enables some things that have been a an, an weekday business for large corporates. They are already multi-banking, multinational. So they expect that for their marginal bank accounts, where they do not have that much transactions, that the main bank delivers uh, the bank account information for them already. So that has been done for decades based on swift messaging. So that's not an issue at all. So that's really natural thing for banks also to consider being themselves as a third party provider, uh, importing in uh, customer information from other financial services and external services. 
But when we go into further details on what kind of APIs there are already available on the market, not only for financial services, but otherwise, then we go into really interesting discussions how to innovate based on that. Good example in, in uh, Finland is Ope Pohjola Bank, who is having their own hospitals and now they have higher bulk cars and, and they are linking them together. For, of course, first of all, a bank running an, an hospital business seems not to be a really good uh, business model, but they have also insurance policy company. So then, we, then you can imagine how they can use that information uh, in, in good terms uh, based on, on different kind of personal health information. So we come here into these areas where we have to also think about the good discussion that you had regarding the sustainability of the banks and financial services. How we can pro provide this infrastructure available for services that, that can benefit out of the financial services information and vice versa, how we can use that uh, to support a better decision making, applying that with artificial intelligence and giving analytics for the customer instead of the raw data of the bank accounts. Mm -hmm. I can mention then how we sort of uh, work with the open banking platform and we even before we launched open banking we still worked a lot with fintechs. I think last year we launched four fintech collaborations uh, and uh, that is uh, coming back to different kind of innovative companies that have built something which could be a niche thing, um, but that we see beneficial for our customers. So we have taken these companies, we have usually embedded them into our services. We have a, a, an example of a Swedish company called uh, Mina Tjänster. They are working with identifying all the subscriptions you have on your uh, account mm -hmm. data, which is a growing trend. Ten years ago, we didn't have so many things on subscriptions. Now we seem to have everything. It's not just electricity and phone. It's your gym card, Spotify, Netflix, etc., etc. With the average household have 20 subscriptions. Uh, they have taken that, summarized it into a short list where you can actually, within now, the mobile bank app, cancel a subscription, change a subscription. You know, this is really, you all of a sudden, you, you're in control of your finances. You can manage this. This is th thanks to a collaboration then between a small startup uh, and a big bank. Uh, so this is exactly the type of collaborations we want to have to help increase value for our customers. And, um, but in order to get a few of these, if I said we launched four collaborations like this last year, I have met 300 fintechs this year in order to sort of filter that down and channel that down. And that's also how we see our open banking platform. We will have open APIs for <coughs> test purposes. Say you, you can test things in small scale, but very, very openly, because we want it to really have this bubbles of innovations and lots of ideas. And then from there, of course, we need to filter out and say not all of these ideas were brilliant, but we actually need the quantity to get to some that are really, really good and really, really useful for our customers. And <coughs> then we sort of lift them up in the, in the pyramid here of becoming a tighter partner and they're more integrated. I really much like your idea, but basically this is, um, this is something where still bank decides what's good and what's bad. Is there an opportunity, no, is no. There an opportunity to do uh, something that actually killed Nokia once upon a time? Because what killed Nokia was not an iPhone. What killed Nokia was the idea that the customers knows much better what they need than Nokia's engineers. So the question here is, uh, is the client able to choose what yes. they want or what uh, they one, need? One yes. comment, Nokia comment. is not dead. It's no. really <laughs> it's feeling really, it's, really It's a really phoenix. Well, <laughs> well yeah. I, I, knew, I knew it's a challenge to take to the fin. It's a phoenix. It's a phoenix. It's, this company has been reborn three times already. Yeah, yes, so, know. but still, uh, taking away from the Nokia so and giving back to the yeah, subject. But to answer that, to say that there, I, I would not see it as just the banks decide and so on. I would see it as a win-win because if you take these, it's also really difficult to be a small startup. They struggle and they have lots of competition and so on. What happens with, if I take the example of Mina Chester, they were successful. They had their their uh, their customer base as an independent app with you know, a couple of 10,000 users. Once we take them and sort of integrate them, they have millions of users. So for them, it's, it's fantastic to be. It's not, they could have made it on their own. We can just give them a faster 
access to success in that sense. But is it um, possible to make an app store for the banking yes, services yes, in absolutely. the SCB, Swedbank, whatever system? Absolutely. Yeah, and and I think for everything, it's going to be lots of niche. If you take corp the corporate area, is even more interesting for that, I would say, because you have so many different types of, we can have one thing that's mainstream, but you will have so many different types of, I'm super interested in Chilean export, and I'm sure there's an app for that. Um, so, <laughs> so then, then this is where open banking is really, really good for really creating this broad, broad base. One, one um, point more regarding this is that, did you know that death ratio for startups is, for common startups, is really much higher than death rate for fintechs? Mm -hmm. And there is a really big issue regarding that. And that's, that's the fact that usually in fintechs there is one, some one old banker or some financial specialist within the company, even with the high innovators and the new, new kids on the block. And that's why they usually are a little bit more sound on the financial basis than the startups overall are. Mm -hmm. But still, what is the death rate of, of, of fintechs? Uh, it's, it's less, I heard sometimes that it, it's, it's about 80% in overall startups and about 50% in fintechs. Mm -hmm. So it's a difference there. So and that's why it's, it's good to know that they have some kind of understanding of, of financial services. I know a lot of fintechs that do not have that much, but they learn really quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I'm talking a lot in, in, within the bank, that how we should change our mindset internally, because when, when we do develop things, uh, the really easy way is to go into the comfortable way doing the process like we have always done, uh, using in-house IT experts, using in-house development. But now in the new world, we are able with the open API technologies and GitHubs and open sourcing, we are able to, to use external development resources. But that's a hard way for, for traditional IT uh, bankers so that they, they have to test themselves, what if I buy this service or this external uh, development effort for, for my product to be available more quickly? What kind of due diligence I have to do? How my compliance is thinking about that? What if that uh, lever, uh, vendor will, will die in three years? So this is a lot of, of this mindset, but if we don't do that, we will continue the same way. We will do this forecasting evolution, trying to get 5 or 10% more every year. But it will fail some 10 years or 15 years. It's an excellent angle because you're coming to the next question. What about, we, we spoke a lot about the technological shift, but what about the mental shift? Because it requires a lot of mental shift, not only in the banks, but also in the startup companies. Because these guys also need to understand how to cooperate with, yes, the, with exactly. the bigger with the bigger animals. But also at the customer side, we also need to start thinking other things when interacting with bank. You know, trusted trusted information or trusted service provider kind of thing. Whom can we trust? Whom can we not? Whom can we give our consent to use our data? Whom not? Can you elaborate more on that? What kind of mental, mental shifts are happening? One good example is this uh, large corporates using treasury management systems or ERPs. A couple of years ago, still, let's say five years ago, it was totally impossible to say that, yes, we will run this treasury management system in a cloud-based service. But now I know exactly that they, the corporates are now moving into totally different approaches, and now they are requiring from their vendors, all traditional TMS and, and ERP vendors, to put their services in the cloud because they don't want to anymore have in-house installations and auditing of their updates and upgrades. And the total cost, cost of ownership is something that is driving their, their uh, push for, for new technologies and new as-a-service-based uh, Templates. So that's that's something that is happening already at the customers, and they are looking for platforms who are able to provide this kind of services for them. And now they are not always anymore directly integrating their systems into bank systems, but they are using already service providers or some kind of third-party providers, so that they they already third-party providers are in a position that they can say that yes, that bank is really easy to integrate. That is not. Even though the corporate is saying that, yes, but the other bank who is not so easy to integrate have good financial services overall. So we will come into the situation that we are also co-creating in the business models how we can strategically make common solutions, common offerings, so that we, we both sides gain in, in, a, in a business. And we come back into this easy integration so that we, when we use these open APIs, and have a more and more services based on that, not only PSD2, then we are in a, in a situation that we can do this collaboration in a better way because the technical 
integration methods should be there available so that we can renew the business models together. Come on. Uh, yeah, I would say that there are essentially th three things that make up this, if the change or the difference between the fintechs and the um, uh, banks, if you say it's how you conduct your business, and it's people, processes, and technology. And we bring in, from the bank perspective, I mean, I'm myself, an example, I've spent 15 years in a s digital startup, or multiple digital startups. We try to bring in as many people as possible that come from a purely digital native background so that they can be triggers of change to many more like traditional bankers. Um, the other thing is processes. I will tell you that the first time we tried to integrate a fintech, that was a little bit of a bumpy ride because our processes were not necessarily arranged for that. It gets faster and faster for each time we do this. We have now gotten sort of... Um, they don't like them, me to call them sort of the usual naysayers, uh, but you know when we talk about risk and compliance and IT security and uh, and legal and so on, Those we have yeah. But rather than having them in the end, sort of when we've done everything and then we come to their as the jury in the end and they say no, we have really changed the process to say to let's include them from start and let them also know that they are not there to say no. They are there to make it possible. They are there to suggest how to make this possible, and that is a massive mental shift that has already happened. Um, I'm super proud of our sort of risk team that really sits in at the table from the start, actually coaching these startup, coaching these fintechs on what they need to do, how they should do things, what how they can tweak things in order to actually become compliant and, and work, be able to work with us. So that's a massive, massive change to both people, mentality and processes. And then I completely agree, we need to be very, very open for new technologies such as cloud and so on. That was also the first discussion was a struggle. Now it's more accepted. Of course, we have partners that, yeah. that do uh, cloud and, and, and so on. It, t it takes a little bit of time, but the more we can merge between fintechs and banks, the better it will actually become for society as a whole, because you want the speed of innovation that the fintechs have. You want that agile mindset, but you also want the security and the, the reliability and the trust that the banks have. And I will see if four years ago, fintechs were over here and banks were over here and everyone thought that this would be a big collide and, and, and so on. We see already that this is this many of the smart fintechs are already working very, very closely with the banks. All banks have massive sort of fintech partnerships programs <coughs> and so on. And it's good for society. Can we um, take, take through in terms of the scale, the scale and the timeline? If we take even the, the market uh, more closer, Nordea opted at some point for their own API standard. UK was experimenting with their own. Then, of course, the regulatory technical standards by the EBA, the Berlin Group standard development, the ISO has announced that they will be looking in the a API standardization space. How do you see all of this both developing in the Nordics, Baltics, and then uh, the timeline and, uh, and, and the scale that each of these initiatives could actually end up uh, having? How many hours do we have left? <laughs> How many do you need? <laughs> <laughs> this is a really difficult question because, like I said, I have a standardization background, even harmonization background. Standard must be there so that we can harmonize things. Otherwise, we cannot do that. So we have to agree on, on, on market practice, market uh, stakeholder level, how to use the standard. And we have succeeded in, in ISO 2022 really well. It's a basement of SEPA. Now even Sweden is, is re renewing their infrastructure to be ISO 2022 enabled in, in payment clearing and so on. And that's happening all over the world. So in the payments domain, we have done really good work. And then comes PSD2. So PSD2 started the standardization work from a regulatory, trans, uh, regulatory technical standard RTS uh, way. And from the beginning, ISO 2022 was, was there in the, in the beginning so that the, all the standards should be based on that business model. Not requiring XML messages because everyone knew that API developers will use RESTful APIs and JSON instead of XML. So that was a wrong discussion, and now the final version has taken off everything regarding ISO 2022, which is a really bad thing, because still the infrastructure is working based on ISO 2022. When we change, exchange payment information between the banks via clearing systems, we use ISO 2022. But now the uh, third-party providers can implement something else. Of course, we can steer that in PSD2 scope, and we can put our standardization based on, on the standard, so ISO 2022 standard, so that the implications on the interfaces will be 
about the same. But I have access to Swedbank's Nordea, BBVA, Citibank, UK Open Banking uh, sandboxes, and I, I exactly know how different they are already now. So that all harmonization work that we were managed to do with the file-based ISO 2022 communication between corporates and banks will now step five years backwards until we realize that this is not a competition issue, but this is a harmonization issue. I hope that until the end of September 2019, when uh, all this PSD2 should be in production, we have solved this issue somehow. Otherwise, we give, give again a new uh, opportunity for platform who is doing harmonization there in between the third party providers and banks, harmonizing and making transparent the differences of the bank implementations. So in some way, the, um, specifically, if we look at the Latvian market, you know, with the open banking initiatives um, launched, we will have well over 70% of the customers on the local market covered by a single standard, if you will, right? Now, uh, what, is the, uh, what is the shape uh, in, the, in the rest of Nordics? Uh? Yeah, there is some collaboration uh, fora going on. I'm leading in fin Finnish Bankers Association or Finance Finland, one ad hoc group which is now discussing with uh, Nordea and all uh, Finnish operating banks, Danske Bank, OP Pohjola, how many, 14 of banks, how to do this. But of course we have to follow what is happening in UK. UK will go live uh, next week uh, or after six weeks or for some of the nine banks that are mandated to do this. So we have to uh, dig in what they are doing. Danske Bank is one of the Nordic banks, which is also part of that CMA9 banks that have to go live already. They are not in PSD2 scope. They do firstly a UK setup, but they are now expanding that really quickly to PSD2 before they do Brexit and then they will exit the PSD2. But of course, many of the banks, <laughs> this is really silly <laughs> when you hear it, but the, many of the banks are still working in, in European area, EU area, so they have to do PSD2 anyway. Then we have Berlin Group, which is German-led uh, standardization forum in, in Europe, which is now drafting some implementation guidelines. And there are a lot of open issues regarding both of them. But of course, when UK Open Banking is already going live, they have to do something already correctly, onboarding TPPs, uh, doing this account uh, third-party third providers, part. yes, and, and uh, implementing this account information delivery and so on. So we have to follow up, first of all, how they succeed, what implications they will have, and then hopefully on European level we have to get all these four or five different standardization initiatives on the same board and see how we can align them together. So within a bank, are you following all of these? Uh, you have to? Yes. Or, or are you making some bets early on? We have to bet something to start with something. I would, I, would, I would be more pragmatic and say, of course, we want standardization. I think everyone wants standardization over time. But to be pragmatic, we all want to, you know, experiment in, in, and prototype. Yeah, but we, we want to, to have open banking be as good as it can possibly be as early as possible. And then what happens? Of course, we take, we, I mean, we have a multitude of different APIs within the bank. And for us, they might look slightly different in Sweden than they do in the Baltics and so on. We're still going to take, you know, the pragmatic approach to say, let's launch what we have and that to, to start with, and then let's sort of standardize this over time. Uh, so all for that, but I think it's quite <coughs> natural to say that if you look at open banking, if the first six months when everyone launches, of course it's gonna be a little bit different because if we would start, everyone start building everything from scratch, we're not going to have open banking in a few years. So one, point, one point more, we shouldn't uh, forget what is happening outside Europe. W3C, which is an, an, an organization standardizing many things regarding XML and HTTP, all, all of these things that we are using daily. All the browsers are based on W3C standards. They re released in September already web payments uh, interface, meaning that all the browsers Google Chrome, Internet Explorer, Firefox, they will have in, in the browser already embedded uh, a payment initiation module, which all the merchants can easily uh, embed into their services. And that is also really revolutionary. We, we haven't discussed that at all in, in European level, but it's happening already there. And when that will expand to use of Google services and, and uh, Facebook services, even the, the Chinese services from Ant Financial, Financials and Alibay, that will be quite revolutionary. And we might be in a situation in a couple of years that we are not dealing always with the PSD2 APIs, 
but Web Payments API within the browser. Before we go back to the another question, is there any ideas? And oh, here we go. Here we go. The first question was here. On a nerve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, still, there is a risk that uh, Parliament will not adopt RTSs. How this will affect your project on open banking? Yeah. Could it be a showstopper, or you're ready to go forward with the same speed? Yeah, like I said, we have to experiment and, and prototype things. Of course, then in that case, we have to wait for different kind of TP, third party provider license. Uh, registry so that we can do that in a proper way. But already these development portals for different, from different banks that are live, uh, they are using some kind of methods in, in that kind of uh, interfacing. And there will be always, like I said, PSD2 scope is like that, account information payment initiation scope is like this. this. There are already third party providers, service providers that will not get any license, but we still want to collaborate with because they are serving a vast uh, flora of different end customers of ours. So we have to approve them. But of course, then banks have to do a due diligence per service provider without relying on the on the FSA based licenses or or registries. So this will also go uh, in terms of that. And of course, in that terms also, we can charge for the interface. Mm -hmm. In PSD2 scope, when it's a licensed third party provider, we cannot charge on the, on the APIs. I but agree fully. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, uh, Karel Eller from the Ministry of Finance in Estonia. Um, I have a bit more general question. Uh, PSD2 is not the end of history, and probably in a few years we are, we'll have a PSD3. <laughs> So uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think uh, will be the next big thing in PSD3, or what is your wish list so, uh, so that uh, it can support more innovation in the payment sector? Thank you. I heard no. yesterday that there is AML5 version coming up. Mm -hmm. Regarding anti-money anti -money laundering, which is, uh, which is taking care of some of the cryptocurrency wallets. So they will be also uh, regulated somehow anyway. So this is a full of... Uh, we are in a business that is really heavily regulated. There we are collaborating with the, with the regulators. But the new technology is a good thing in regulation perspective too. Let's come from the ISO 2022 perspective. Uh, there is a lot of things happening regarding that uh, together with ECB, for example. The, the MIFID reporting from the banks to the ESMA is based on ISO 2022. They really want to standardize and harmonize things also at the regulator side, because again, it's, a, it's now requiring a hell of a lot of efforts and hands and, and people, and they want to start using RegTech type of solutions using AI and, and blockchain blockchain based solutions so that we do not send from the banks different opinions what kind of derivative this is, but we hopefully someday will have only one single truth of derivative instance information. And then it's really much easier together with regulators to analyze and, and see what is the status of this instrument, financial instrument. But nowadays we are still having these bank specific silos and, and we have uh, interpretations of, of same things and I, I really hope that this kind of collaboration with the with the regulators will will go on because we have to save also in costs regarding the regulation we we are really eager to report things but we have to do that in a so in a way that is uh, benefiting the processes and and costs and operations on both sides I'd like to, to sort of comment on that just because I think even I'm, I'm not going to say a wish list for PSD3, uh, but what I'm afraid of is that the uh, regulations are yet for PSD3 going to lag behind <laughs> technology. Uh, we can see that already today we have a sort of a voice enabled payments through Alexa for example, and we had this incident in the US, which I thought was quite hilarious, uh, with uh, you know a small girl having her overheard her mom order things through Alexa, and this small girl is sitting at home saying, Alexa, order me a dollhouse and cookies. Uh, you know, and Alexa actually does that. Uh, and, and this became a story. This mom had a journalist friend, uh, and this journalist is repeating this on uh, national TV. Say, saying exactly, Alexa, order me a dollhouse and cookie on TV because it was a funny story. 
and the TV is on in multiple homes in America where Alexa is like is on uh, overhearing the TV picking up ordering dollhouse and cookies so like I mean I, I still say think technology is way ahead of where whatever regu regulation is trying to keep catch up so so uh, just one, one more question we, we have, Amanda, just one quick clarification in terms of the regtex. Are we saying that all the new regulations will be transmitted in XML format or no, any other no, format? No, I'm not saying that, but we, um, we have to agree on, on the language that we are uh, dealing with each other. So that if we have a basement for common language like ISO 2022 is offering, why not using that? Of course, how we, how we do the things, it's, it's much more that the process is. Uh, and, and like I said, the new technology gives both sides opportunities to make things easier than we do down nowadays. So in a way, the future for the Ministry of Justice is when the law gets adopted in the parliament, it's transcripted and uh, planted into all the systems directly, right? So that's, that's the future. Uh, hello, Andrus Bolshaitis, head of uh, Innovation Center at SCB Lithuania. Uh, my question is about uh, not only PSD2, but on a broader context of collaboration between banks, among banks and fintechs, uh, no matter probably how, how big a bank is, uh, the ambition for a fintech, and in order to be successful, it has to be uh, able to connect and collaborate with many banks in Europe, which are like, I heard, more than 4,000 probably in European Union. Yeah. And uh, for the banks also, in order to be able to... Uh, uh, use all the possibilities that fintech world provides, they need to be able to also interact with many fintechs that are also in thousands already probably somewhere. And uh, this for me, uh, in my head, uh, looks like a new business model for a uh, middle man or middle layer that yes. would uh, create okay, yeah, like... Coming up. And my question is, if you are already in this business and working uh, together with fintechs, you mentioned a lot of interactions to you during this year, how m well do you see already this middleman has been developed and what is the potential future? Maybe the, the contact point for the banks should, shouldn't be the fintechs themselves, but this middle layer who should organize all this in. I, it depends on what type of partnership it will be. It's one thing if we only speak about payments and API hubs and, and so on. That, that's that we can see, and as long as we're not standardized, uh, th that there might be room for uh, middle layer. But I would say for other examples of, of companies, fintechs that we sort of partnered with and invested in, even if we're a minority shareholder, say, uh, I'd see it as, as the opposite. We sort of uh, can guarantee the success of this fintech, but we will also be the first one to open the door when this fintech, a Swedish fintech, for example, when they want to collaborate with a Spanish bank, we are the reference. We are the ones that will g give them the introduction and open the door and, and help sort of push them into expand globally. Why wouldn't we? We want to be a, big, a good partner to these companies. So I think, but it completely depends on how close that collaboration is and what type of partnership it is. Um, one point more is that what, which is part of this mindset change in the banks. I have been promoting that now there will be a new persona when we do this design thinking uh, development for our products and services. Now we have listed, yes, this is a treasury, this is a private person, this is an elderly private person, how we respond to the services and needs of theirs. But there will be a new person, uh, and uh, that's the external developer mm -hmm. who is scanning all over the financial services, what kind of APIs are available, and they actually decide on behalf of their end customers uh, that what kind of banks and what kind of APIs they are going to implement. And that's why we have to take care of that in our development, that our APIs are intriguing and they are easily found in different kind of platforms or marketplaces or wherever so that they, they can do the integration as, as easy as possible. There has to be good documentation, good example cases, and also this onboarding of these third-party providers must be as automated as possible, because also in onboarding, we do not have that much time to spend like we do now in file-based integrations. We can spend a couple of days or weeks, but in, in, in this kind of APIs, that should go like this in a couple of minutes, and, and of course, we have a lot of uh, challenges to make that happen in that time, but we, we have to aim into that. And that's why we have to take care of that new persona. 
not I'd only end yeah. customers but these developers i'd say that's that's how it is now in open banking at least on on our side that you can sign up in, in more in anyone can sign up and become we have over a thousand since we launched two months ago we have over a thousand users on our open banking uh platform because it literally takes five seconds to sign up on the basic level where you can start testing things and experimenting and so on then if you want you know full access to everything, then we do our d due diligence and, and, and checks a little bit later, but to just welcome you to start testing things. Very, very open, one very easy. One final question. Uh, so, you know, in a way we're looking at a very decentralized world also internally within the banks, where if we have the trend, if, if we look at the trend for the data analytics is that this will shortly be a self-service data analytics by all the employees of the banks trying to analyze on the basis of available data. Now the world you're pointing to is that the APIs will be in thousands, if not tens of thousands, over the coming, uh, coming years. And pretty much every single employee of a bank has to have an understanding of what they are dealing with, whether they are advising the customers, how they're thinking about their own processes. How are you tackling the challenge of uh, getting everybody up to speed on what are APIs, how to work with them, how to, how to think about uh, the developments? You have to be an evangelist, the ones that are understanding where we are going. This is like there was one slide saying that this, there is no U-turn. There is no U-turn. So if we think that we will manage with the same uh, strategy and, and politics that we have had for 160 years in SCB, for further 160 years. That will not happen. We have to change our minds. We, we, we cannot close our eyes from, from the digitalization that is happening there. And we know that exactly because, luckily, our customers are having the same challenges. Private customers, small enterprises, and even the large corporates, they are needing for help. And we cannot help them and advise them otherwise than knowing ourselves something about this. I'll admit that one of my KPIs is actually how many people within the organization have I included in an active innovation workshop. It's not enough to say that they have sort of listened to an inspirational yeah. session. They need to be hands-on working with innovation. That's one of my KPIs. And we have multiple evangelists. Uh, Geertz, for example, and many others. So we, we absolutely have, I, I completely agree, we need to work across all units um, in many, many forums uh, and active, but I think it needs to be hands-on as well. Y you, you can't just tell people how to be different. They need to feel it and experience it and, and be part of it. And people, um, people working in bank, it's, it's quite funny. When you are at home, you are a, a banking customer, but when you come to do your work, suddenly you forget everything <laughs> that you are you are needing as a banking customer. So you are th starting to think from the old traditional banking process perspective. That has to be changed. Harry, Emma, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> my co-host Sanda, thank you very much. I think you deserve a big hand. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Emma. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>